are we ready to look at a study and actually kind of drill down into how one reads a study? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, my, I, uh, I think I mentioned this yesterday, but it would be good for me to say again. The first time that I have ever read an academic journal publication in any field whatsoever was the first day of graduate school. I had, wow. never, okay. I had never seen uh, a published article before that. Um, so it was kind of overwhelming, right? Like I, yeah. I was there in grad school and everyone else, like the, the, the assignments like, oh, write up an article critique and just find an article and then write about it. And I'm like, yeah, I can exactly like what you said, right? Um, yeah. I can pull up articles right now. I cringe to think that I thought that first article critique I wrote was a good article to even write on. I'm like, why? <laughs> Right, very embarrassing. But one thing that I'd learned pretty soon in grad school was this magic called learning uh, meta-analyses. Okay. Uh, meta-analysis or even a systematic review. Both meta-analysis and systematic reviews are summaries of the research literature and they give you a big picture of what's happening. So it's more breadth. And for me, if it's the first time that I'm learning about a topic, like you mentioned, I've heard about concept mapping. I want to know a little more about it, like just mm -hmm. high level for uh, to start with to test if it works. I definitely go with a meta analysis or a systematic okay. review. And you, oh. Yes, no, go ahead. I was you kind of you define meta analysis earlier, but yeah, go ahead and, and let's give a formal definitions of both of those. Yeah, so the difference between a meta-analysis and a systematic review is a meta-analysis is a quantitative summary. So we're trying to say, on average, across all of these studies, how effective is this strategy? Okay. On the so. other hand, a systematic review gives you more a thematic uh, analysis and more, um, yeah, like a thematic analysis of the papers that have been published. And they're both looking at multiple, multiple, multiple studies. It's just that one of them is a little more conversational and the other one is actually crunching the numbers. Yes, as conversational as awkward academics can be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And I, I want to tell people, like, this is something uh, which, you know, I want to use this chance to say, researchers, we write in a particular way, but we're still human. And when you talk to us, most of us don't talk in that same language. Mm. So if you're feeling tripped up or like you really like to study, but you don't understand it, email and ask, hey, can I chat with you for half an hour? I don't know how likely that's going to be a yes, but I'm pretty sure like if someone emailed me or a few others, they'd be like, yeah, sure. I'd love to talk to you about my studies. Mm. So, okay. The academic writing is a learned skill, not our natural tongue. So we're going to be looking at a meta analysis. Yes, let's start with the meta analysis. Okay. I'll, um, heads up, meta analysis will always feel intimidating, even to a researcher. Okay. They are 35 to 50 pages long and have about 10 big tables with lots mm -hmm. of numbers, a few plots, and it can look and feel very smart. Um, but it's still a really nice read. Break it over days, though. Break it over days, definitely. Okay. Uh, I know uh, the Review of Educational Research is a wonderful journal to keep an eye out for meta-analysis and systematic reviews. They almost exclusively only publish that across a variety of topics. Okay. So, like, speaking of, is this a good journal? Review of Educational Research yeah. really is. Uh, there's also Educational Psychology Review. Those two are the ones that I'm familiar with in my world of work. So. Okay. Uh, so, staying on task of like how do we read the meta-analysis, the first step is to read the abstract. Mm -hmm. The abstract is basically a quick <clears throat> high-level summary of what's happening in the paper. It will tell you how many studies, so in this um, they have looked at 55 studies involving 5,818 participants. And they give you a small description of what, uh, you know, that the students were from grade four to post-secondary. And they used concept maps in science, psychology, stats, and nursing. This is not typically comprehensive, but if it's super important or if it's like substantive, it will mostly find a place in the abstract. 
right? Um, it will also tell you a quick summary, I guess, of the results. Yeah, and this is the place that I always go when I'm trying to find research to support something is I'll look and usually by the end of the abstract, you get a sense of what they uncovered or decided mm -hmm. by the end, okay. And uh, the next trick is one, uh, one hurdle that I've often heard from folks is, I don't understand that language. There's far too much jargon in yeah. it, right? Um, 100% resonate with that. It's been something I've been trying to stay mindful of as even I work on my writing journey. But there are some terms that as researchers, you can't use another term mm. simply because that's going to muddy up waters. And a lot of water has been muddied in that way, right? X calling it something and then Y calls it something else. Yeah. But most authors will describe, uh, define their main idea topic. Mm -hmm. So that way you can check, is this the same as how you're thinking about it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's true, whether it's a meta-analysis or an individual study. So in this one, it's in the very first line. Okay. And so usually and, the first few paragraphs are good to read after the abstract, just as an introduction to the study, a little bit of background and understand. Or the definitions and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, when it comes to a meta-analysis, feel welcome to kind of scroll down uh to look at over here hypothesized cognitive and self-regulatory effects um sounds super Ooh, fancy right? yep this is where my brain would be like bye yep so if you see the word hypothesis or theoretical framework uh -huh. and these words are fairly similar in both like your individual studies and your meta-analysis that's your hook your why Okay. Why do I expect an effect? Why am I expecting that the strategy will work? And in what okay. way do I think it's going to work? Okay. Um, and this is where I was telling you, right? Like getting that overall framework in mind so you can kind of assess strategies as they yes. come in. So, so this hypothesized is in a passive voice. They're saying, here's what we are looking for. This is what we're expecting to find in these. And this is what we think will be the and results. Why. And yes. why do you think it's so? And sometimes okay. it's called theoretical framework, which is easy. Okay. Okay. Um, so if we scroll down, like in this paper, they look at multiple reasons. They say, hey, maybe it's dual coding. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, maybe it's verbal coding. Uh, or it's just um, the elaboration part of learning strategies. Uh, and that concept maps could be affected for different types of students, typically those with low verbal ability. Um, and just the different ways that you can do collaborative and cooperative. So these authors went, uh, looked at the same problem from multiple different frameworks. More often, people just look at one or two frameworks at most to kind of look at what they're studying. So it won't typically be as long. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, next piece that you want to look at in a meta-analysis is the study selection criteria or what they call an inclusion criteria. Why that's important is it's gonna tell you what kind of studies were included in a meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. No meta-analysis is like 100% complete because then we will never publish it. Um, so the inclusion criteria tells you which studies we decided we're taking in mm -hmm. till what time. So like the meta-analysis and retrieval practice, I think we closed the doors on that in 2014 or yeah, yeah, we closed the data collection in 2014 and it got published later. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's helpful to read through that to see, oh, okay, uh, what, what have they, whom have they included? But let's say you said all that, you can kind of, and you're like, oh, I don't have the time to read this 36 pages. I don't care about it. You can always just scroll all the way down. To yeah, your right. That's the stuff that I always skip. As soon as I start to see what looks like trigonometry to me, I'm like, okay, it's just, yeah. Most and, I, and I was a good math student. That's the frustrating part of it is that I was a good math student, but still it's gone now. Well, most, most meta-analysis now don't necessarily include the equation. They typically don't. Um, so okay. You're all good. So when we go into the results section, 
Mm -hmm. Typically, either the first or second table is going to have, where is that second table? Voila. Here, weighted mean effect sizes for concept maps constructed and studied by geographical location. You see this category all? Uh huh. That's the table that you want to look at, where it either says overall or all. And this tells you across all of the studies that they've studied, what is the result? So what this sentence here is telling me is across all of the studies, uh -huh. they had 5,818 students and they pulled out 67 unique experiments. That's what K stands for, the number of experiments? Yes. Okay. And the 0 .604, 0 0.2 weight is your mean and your uh, standard error, which is basically your average, right? 0.6. 04 is the average gain in the score. So that's not, um, so for example, if I had a test out of 10 points and my kids typically scored five out of 10, if I did concept maps with them, this paper suggests that they'll be scoring 5.6 the next time. Okay. Uh, for kind of like translating that. The guide that we published on retrieval practice has like more information on like how do we translate that effect size. So that would be a handy resource to have in hand when okay. reading these tables. Um, just one more point on the table and then we'll jump shop to the individual study. Okay. Uh, I really want folks to look at this piece where it says confidence interval. Think of it like the range of impact. Your lowest, lowest impact could be 0.55 all the way up to about 0.66. And that kind of helps you weigh how much you're going to trust that result. So anything above zero. So with when it when it comes to effect size, if I'm looking at any study, effect size is positive or negative. This is how much this thing impacted mm -hmm. the learning. Yeah. Up means it, it positively impacted it, down negative means it negatively. And generally, I mean, it seems like when I've seen effect sizes, I can't, I don't think I've ever seen anything higher than like the number four. Is that even a reach? Usually it's- That's a very big reach. I think. That would be very high. Okay. So I'm thinking it's like, it's, you know, 1.3 or something like that would be That's very, very big. high. That's over, a, you know, over, over a hundred percent increase on- yeah. Okay. Okay. So these are something that's in these decimal ranges is still very significant. Yes. Okay. And you need to remember that this is all in averages, right? It's on average. This is right. Zero. So let's say uh, if you take this study and you're like, let's do concept maps in class. Well, concept. Yeah. It's going to take time to actually hit that result. Okay. Um, because your students need to be trained in concept mapping and then you implement it. So it might take you two to three lessons to even start seeing a difference. So if you're really interested in a strategy, maybe applying it a few times will help you look through it. Okay. Um, but the reason I want to show this is if you pulled up a meta-analysis and saw this and you didn't read through the rest of it, which I love reading through because there's a story there kind of saying what and why and how and all of that. Yeah. But this kind of gives you this idea that, okay, that's not too bad. And now my kids are, you know, in a 10, if it was a 10 point and it's jumping up by 0.6, then, hey, maybe if I had 100, imagine that jump. Right. Right? Like it could very well be the difference from a B to an A minus or right. a C to a B plus, right? So then you're like, okay, I love this. Then how do I read more, right? How do mm -hmm. I know whether this works for my context? Scroll down to the reference list. Mm -hmm. um, and look for the ones that have the asterisks, because the that one means they included that in the meta analysis. Okay, okay, and those would be the ones to, to drill down more deeply. Yeah, you can look into it more deeply. Um, okay, and then just looking into that. So I've pulled one up here. Can I, can I hold on? Can I stop you before we do that? And then I want to go back to the meta analysis one last time. I wanted to make sure that we also get down to the discussion because we looked at the numbers. Yes. And I know that even if I'm somebody who is willing to try looking at the tables a little bit, I 
untrained, I would absolutely want to get to the results section to confirm that I, that what I read there is actually what they're concluding also. Sure. This particular paper, they combined their results in discussion. So okay. it's actually built into this. Um, but I was thinking I'll use the other paper to kind of walk through the- Okay. The but within, with any time you're, you're actually looking at studies, whether it's a meta-analysis or an individual study, you do want to always make sure you go down to the discussion and the results to- Yeah. In, yeah, and the conclusion. Okay. Yeah, so in this meta-analysis, they combine the results, this part of the discussion, but they do have like a conclusion section that's like a, long story short, this is what we think. Okay, um, got these it. These are the two findings. This is where the evidence is. Here are some things that we need to work on, uh, that kind of stuff. 